Yo, what's poppin' everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, episode of Caffeine and Green with your man, Connor Cardenas. And per usual, I want to make sure you guys are heading over to www.caffeineandgreenroasting.com. That's right. That's where you can get all of the amazing coffees that I c- continuously talk to you guys about. Of course, I'm talking about the Issa Blend, that morning sesh, the collab with Shieldless Mag, and that victory lap inspired by our homegirl, Leov Clockley. That's right. And also, if you want to, you can head on over to get any Caffeine and Green merch that's available right now. Of course, I'm talking about the Sugar Skull mug, some t-shirts, the hoodies, and uh, I think that's kind of it for right now. (laughs) But there is some new stuff dropping, guys. And so head on over to www.caffeineandgreenroasting.com today for all your coffee and merch needs. Also, if you guys haven't been up to Oceanside, California, you should definitely stop by Steel Mill Coffee. That's right. I'm talking about that amazing coffee shop that is on Mission Boulevard in Oceanside, California, and it's run by my amazing homies. I'm talking about Shay, Anna, Little C, Giles, and my homie Joel, and of course, Riley. If you guys haven't been in there, I would recommend going in, grabbing a cup of coffee because you know your man right here also roasts the coffee for Steel Mill. I know if you go in, everybody would be super stoked to see you. So again, Head on over to Steel Mill Coffee today. All right. My guest today, for you guys who don't skate, will definitely need an introduction. But if you skateboard, you definitely know who JT Rhodes is. That's right. He is a very famous photographer, but he start, got his start in skateboarding, uh, skateboarding photography. And he's, you know, he's been at Transworld. He's been at Thrasher. He's, uh, I mean, well, he's been in Thrasher. And then the skateboard mag. I mean, the list is endless. And he has amazing, amazing skills and talents. And it was just super awesome to get to talk to him about his travels and what he's been doing with his life for the last 17 years and his passion in uh, photography and just how he got started. So without further ado, Maji. JT Rose. This is your time to shine, homie. Let's go. Give me cap, 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 be green. It's your boy Connor. What's good? Good, good. Cap, 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 be green. Cap, be green. And we are live. Hello, hello. JT Rose, welcome to Caffeine and Green, sir. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Ooh. <laughs> That's a, ooh. That was the first that's ever actually happened on the show. Cheers. Cheers. Come on, okay. bring it in. Oh. You're too far away. There yeah. we go. Got you, G. Yeah, you know, we're <laughs> drinking that uh, fine mineral water from Monterey, Mexico. I'm not going to name the names, but it's pretty good. Agua mineral. You know, I love this shit. Yes. Dude, so uh, fucking. Wait, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a Owl Farm Watermelon Tajin Gos. I heard that's really good. It's, Dude, it's my favorite beer. I wouldn't n- normally drink... Uh, consecutively last night i did a podcast and I, we drank like a uh, some buffalo trace whiskey which was really nice but the girl that was on last night essence mcconnell she was like i just really like a whiskey either over the rocks or neat and it's like but she's like it has to be a good whiskey i was like oh okay mm. well fucking mm. a and it was dude i swear to god i i'm a big believer in nice whiskeys now because i woke up this morning no hangover yeah when i drank which i don't do anymore but when i drank I couldn't really do whiskey every time. Like after one night, I uh, drank a bottle of Jack Daniels, which is probably the worst whiskey you can drink. Yeah. But just woke up throwing up everywhere. I actually threw up all over uh, Steve Clare's w- uh, wife's house. It was before it was his wife, but like we were in high school, and I threw up a whole bottle of Jack Daniels all over the wall of her house while her parents were gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then she got caught for having a party because I had thrown up on the wall and they couldn't get rid of the smell, I guess. Like, no. <laughs> but yeah, so I don't really miss whiskey, but like, that seems pretty good. That watermelon tahini, everyone talks <coughs> about how good that is. I'm like, damn, that sounds nice. But you know, that's why I do these uh, bubble waters. They feel like they're alcohol or like beer or something. That's what I remember you were saying when we went to go shoot the other day. Yeah. You were like, it, it, remi- it makes you feel like it's beer. Yeah, you know, that's good. It's like I get to crack the bottle. I make it fucking pop, you know. It's, it's fun. How long have you been sober? Five and a half years. Five and a half years? Yeah. How old are you? Uh, 32. Oh, I damn, I forgot dude. for a second right there. <laughs> dude, it's okay. I forget all the time. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Don't say it too much. But, yeah, 32. Damn. Yeah, it was a good party for a little while, you know, till it wasn't. So that's interesting because, uh, so... Just a quick background for people who don't know who you are. Can you actually like grab the mic and push it up? Just there we go. Perfect. Um, your Bob's brother, Troye Rhodes. Troye Bush. Dude, love that name. 
Um, also Lanny, who's also been on the show. So you're the third brother. And then there's Forrest. Yeah, Forrest has got to be, maybe he should have been on here today. <laughs> He's got a lot to say. Dude, you definitely got a lot to say. You tripping. Stop playing. I know. But dude, no, so you're the third Rose brother on the show. Um, and like what well, the reason one of the main reasons, like we were we were shooting the other day. Yeah, shooting in the the roasting. In the uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the roasting collective. Yeah, roasting collective. And, but the thing that kind of blew my mind, I mean, like, dude, I've obviously knew who you were, like, cause I skateboarded, you know, I've been a skateboarder since little kid, little kid mm-hmm. and, you know, coming down here. And then as I started, was in the skate scene, um, in LA and San Diego, I definitely heard of who you were before I ever actually met you. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, then I got to actually meet you in the shop and it was like, oh shit. But then, you know, it, like, there's always like that, like that part of me, I feel like that's, um, uh, like a fucking, what is it? Like a fanboy almost like, Oh shit. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. No, I was going to, I didn't know if he was going to show up anymore. So for people who can't see Shay just walked in. So I was going to film you right there. Say what up? Yeah. Yeah. Say what up. Hi, Hop Shay. on the mic real quick. Shay. How are you doing? Just what's say what up. What do you have to say? Oh, uh, what's up fam? <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. But yeah. So, um, it was definitely uh, more of like a fanboy aspect, but now that I've gotten to hang out with you, it's like, dude, we fucking just shoot the shit in the shop. You'll be hanging out here. You'll be editing your photos. Your brother comes in. Oh, both of your brothers come in quite often. Bob's probably here the most. But he likes coffee. Dude, he loves coffee. He's got he's got a a good appetite for it. I get anxiety after like a cup and a half, and I'm gonna freak out. So. Well, you do like the dirty chai, or you do the chaga. Well, it used to be like three Americanos, four Americanos a day, and it was just like giving me anxiety, so I had to stop. Whoa. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. Wow. And I would just come here, and I'd freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Okay, so one thing I definitely wanted to get in, so for people who don't know you, uh, for the listeners, uh, you are a photographer. You've been a photog- photographer from what you told me at the collective for like 17 years. 17 years. I picked up a camera in my uh, junior year of high school. Or maybe like s- end of sophomore year, I started shooting uh, black and white film photography, and uh, I was trying to. I knew that Oceanside High School had like a film program, but I was so credit deficient they weren't gonna allow me into it. And wow. I was like, well, this is fucking whack. So what the hell do I have to do? So I found out that Mira Costa had a program, and I was like, damn, I'll go to Mira Costa after school and smoke joints and just develop black and white photos in the dark room and like. It really got me excited after the first roll. I think the first roll of photos I ever shot was probably the best photos I've ever shot, which is coincidence because I'm still doing it 17 years later, which is uh, pretty shocking, you know. But, um, yeah, no, I got... And why were they the best photos? Because I had no clue what I was doing. I wasn't trying too hard or something. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so, like, I went there, and that was, like, a super fun experience. Like, I had a bunch of homies in the class, and we'd go... Uh, we'd go smoke a joint in the parking lot and then go out and like go back to class and like they'd teach us whatever we needed to learn. But going in the dark room was just blacked out and you're just like watching, excuse me, watching this photo appear on a piece of paper that you shot some light onto and you're like, what the hell is happening? Like, it's just such a crazy thing. And it just kept me going. It gave me a lot of drive to continue to shoot photos. And then, um, probably like after like six months to a year, I was like, I need to try something different. So I, uh, my friend, uh, Brendan Klein, who is like a really good photographer. He, sh- he worked at Transworld at that point, I believe. And, uh, his camera bag got stolen at Jefferson elementary school here in Oceanside or middle school. And, uh, his whole camera bag got stolen and he got a check from his insurance company to, uh, get a whole new setup cause everything was stolen. And then he worked also at the local camera store. It's called OPT. And he was working one day and someone brought his camera bag in and was like, Hey, uh, we want to sell this. And he's like, Oh really? And he's like, that's mine in his head, you know? And he's like, Oh yeah, let me take it in back and I'll figure out, uh, how much it's worth. And he went in the back and he just like told his boss, like, Hey, someone just brought in my gear. What do I do? Like, this is mine. And he's like, Oh, call the cops. And he's like, all right. (laughs) And so he's like, calls the cops and he goes back out and he tells the dudes, he's like, Hey, this was uh, reported stolen. So I had to let the authorities know. And, um, they're on their way and they're like, fuck this, we're out, you know? So they bailed. And then, um, he had told me that he got a shit back and I was like, fuck dude, like, what are you going to do with that extra camera? I'd really be psyched to like get a digital camera and learn how to start shooting photos with that. Cause I had no clue how to do it, you know? Like, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, he sold me 
my dad helped me buy it, but like he sold me uh, the camera for like two grand with like two lenses and the batteries and shit. And uh, that's kind of what started it, you know. That's wow. like that. It, it, and it's crazy from that term term of turn of events to like that's what like got me into shooting photos like of skateboarding more because like with the film it was like you can't really make it as well or like I, you could make it then as a film photographer because that was like right when the transition was happening where everyone was going from film to digital mm -hmm. like the camera i got was like four megapixels which oh. is like an iphone's probably like 20 now at this point you know and it's like that was like 2006 i believe 2006 is when i got the digital camera so like i had been shooting for probably like six months to a year with the film camera and then I got that and it was like that that really changed things for me I was like out in the streets every day shooting skateboarding and just trying to like make something of it you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. who was the like the first dude you started shooting like consistently uh we used to hang out with this dude named Mike Santa Fe Mike McCandlish uh he was like on XYZ and Duff's and like he had lived over here uh right by the Oceanside Transit Center and like we're, he was the dude that we all looked up to. He was gnarly as fuck. He was like best friends with like Trainwreck and Steve-O and all these dudes and oh, just doing man. all this crazy ass shit. He was a fucking wild animal. It was like him, Michael Prince, RIP, Danny Cher, Anthony Schultz, uh, Bob, Lanny, you know. just like, like the, the NS crew? Yeah, just like NS, but then like a bunch of other homies, you know, like whoever was around. But yeah, it was basically like Ego Mob is what it originally was and then it like transferred over. Like once we started hanging out with a different crew of fools like so um yeah when we like started hanging out with the dudes we kind of grew up with like bb and mouse like we went to school with them in like second grade or i was in second grade lanny was probably in like fourth grade and uh we went to school with them and then we kind of lost track or like lost touch with them for a little while and then we started hanging up back out with them and they were like this fucking crew of fools that was ns no standards they're super fucking rough around the edges they were partying all the time and it was like Oh yeah, we're hanging out with them now. And I was like, damn, these fools are fucking crazy. Like going to all these parties with these fools. Like, damn, they're fucking doing some fucked up shit, you know? Like, <laughs> but it was like, I was like 14 when I started hanging around them, and it was always like, way beyond what I knew at that point because they were all 18, 17. You know, they're adults by that point basically, and it was like crazy just to see what the fuck their partying was like compared to what I had thought partying was when I was in middle school high school you know like well yeah you're 14 <laughs> well yeah so i started shooting with all those dudes you know like that's kind of where it uh started you know um at that time i was working at the local skate shop asylum and uh that's kind of where i really started like learning how to shoot photos i was still fucking super dumb with it you know like i didn't really pay attention i was smoking so much damn weed that it didn't really make sense to me to kind of like look into magazines and see w what I should be shooting. Like I was just shooting, I was just going for it fucking yeah. every day, you know? And like, um, I had gotten to, uh, the opportunity to shoot a photo for the local magazine called automatic. It was like a skate mag. Yeah. Like, I remember automatic. Yeah. And so, um, my first photo that I ever got ran in a magazine was, uh, Mike McCandlish, Mike Santa Fe. And he was skating this spot right by his house. Cause he never left like a one mile radius of his house. So wow. like we just skated everything around here and it was just like, he had to get back to go smoke bong rips at his house. So he didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that was fucking super crazy. And, um, yeah, after I got that first photo ran, which was a vertical photo, it was like, they ran their ad as a vertical photo in this magazine. So like, for a year, I think I don't, I don't think I shot a horizontal photo like the whole time. Cause I was like, everything's going to be a fucking ad. So just keep fucking shooting like this. And it took me like a year to realize like, Hey, what the fuck am I doing? You know, like I was just so fucking psyched on like possibly getting another fucking photo in this magazine. I think I ended up getting like 10 ads in that magazine for the skate shop. And it was like, that was probably which got me, what got me so psyched to try to continue doing that. You know what I mean? Like yep. I just was super hyped on seeing photos in print. That's like how it started for me. It was like pretty much the first like three years I started getting within like two and a half years of shooting photos, three years, I started getting photos ran in that magazine. And it was like, Oh shit. Like I can fucking possibly do this, you know? Like, yeah. so it got me super excited. Dude, that's super did. So wait, super rad that you did all that, but you, you were working at Asylum. Did you work there at the same time Pablo did? Yeah, I worked with Pablo. Pablo, the now very famous tattoo artist. Yeah. Yeah, he, he used to sit in the back and just draw all day long. And, like, 
I remember because I we'd always be fucking around. And I was like talking shit to him. I'm like, dude, fucking work. But he was my manager, so he'd be like, no, you work. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know. But like, I would just, <laughs> oh, yeah. I would just, <laughs> I would just fuck with him because I mean, truthfully, he would yell at me all day long because I'd just be sitting there staring at magazines trying to learn about photography. You know, like what the fuck is? Where's that flash at? Where like how did he shoot it? You know, like just nerding out. But then he'd be sitting in the back drawing some crazy ass shit. And I'm like, dude, you're fucking gnarly. And he wasn't even tattooing at that point, you know? Yeah. I've, uh, well, I was the alien workshop and, uh, well, it's the DNA rep. I was yeah. the alien workshop okay. habitat, yeah. whatever else shit that they were selling at the time. And so I would, that was one of my accounts. Yeah. So I'd go in there and they were like, Oh, Pablo's a buyer. Yeah. And so I would go in and kick it with him. And then I remember like for a couple of years I would see him and like, he'd let, he'd get like, let us put our, our, sh- our, like, our homie video in there. Yeah. And then I remember the day he told me, he's like, dude, so like I'm starting this apprenticeship, like I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden he fucking just became this dude. He comes from a, a very artistic family. His mother is a very, very talented artist. She had an art show, fuck, 15 years ago up here at what used to be OPT. And it was the photo store, but like they had some art gallery downstairs and fuck she's a very talented woman like she makes like lithographs and like print transfers and like super crazy charcoal drawings and just like all this insane work she's Whoa. super super good and i think it like probably inspired him or he probably learned a lot from it because i've been to his house before or his parents house and like there was art all over the place she had easels and stuff up and like she was constantly making art i believe so like i think that's what kind of taught him the the early stages of all that, you know, like yeah. he, he's very intricate with his work. His shit's super Dude, fucking good. Dude, it's so gnarly. And so he's, he's blown up, you know, like, yeah, but I mean, he's good at it. So it makes sense that he would blow up, you know, like, I mean the intricacies in his lines, like the way he pulls the lines and like the, just how it looks. It's like, God damn, you could, it really looks like a statue. Somebody will fucking hit it on, on their body. It's like, yo dude, like, Real talk. You got to do that shit. Yeah, no, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I got a bunch of shitty tattoos, but, you know, that's just the fun. I've never actually got one from Pablo, but I think his shit's probably too nice for me. No, nah, nah, <laughs> you just you pull it off. You just, like, for one day, just get, like, you know, have all your shitty tattoos. I have shitty tattoos as well. But then... You know, just get like that really, really nice one. I kind of almost gave up on the idea of getting any more tattoos. I'm like, I want to reverse my tattoos. Reverse them? Like, get, them ri- get rid of them? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, dude, everyone's got sleeves now. I'm like, I'm fucking over it, dude. <laughs> I'm going back to fucking no tats. Yeah. No, Mike Santa Fe, the dude that I was talking about, first photo I ever got ran, he was, uh, he was saying, he's like, dude, I wish I had no tattoos. He's like, so many people got tattoos now. I think it's fucking, it's like cooler to not have tattoos. And my dad was all, damn, he's all, he thinks I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> dude okay so so yeah back to that so yeah so um you're shooting you started you're, shooting with the ns crew michael yeah. prince danny share anthony schultz fucking john cleveland uh, aka b john mouse bb you know all the homies bobby long my brother lanny and um i before i like even before i was shooting photos i'd go out and i'd see lanny because he's been filming probably like five years longer than i've been i'm guessing five longer than i've been shooting and, like, I'd be out on the session all the time, and, like, I'd see all these photographers shooting, and I'm like, damn, dude, like, they're creating such sick fucking shit. And, like, I don't really know how they're doing it, but I'm watching every day, like, very closely, like, what are they doing? How are they doing this? Where are they putting these things? Like, what, why are there flashes in the spots they're at? Like, what tools do they have to make this shit work? And I was, like, always just, like, watching very closely and, like, breaking it down and... um I just started asking all of them questions and befriending all of them as much as I could because I really wanted to be a part of this, like, skate scene because I already knew I sucked. Like, I wasn't as good as any of my friends growing up, and, like, I was more accident-prone than I was landing, so it was like, how can I continue to hang out with my friends and, like, go places, you know? And I was like, all right, well, Lanny Films, I'm not going to try to pursue that. I'll try to pursue shooting photos, you know? And, like, I was interested in it, you know? Like, I, I had the film camera and, like, it got me excited to try to go into the digi world. And then like I got some photos ran in those in that small local magazine. And at that time, Lanny is always shooting with the homie Blair Alley, who's mm-hmm. from uh, San Diego. And Blair was working at Transworld that time. And he'd always stay on our couch because Transworld was, was in Oceanside. And uh, I was always just picking his brain because I was like starting to shoot photos. And I was like, dude, is there any way, like, I had heard of this kid was interning from around here, and I was like, is there any way that I could get in there? He's like, ah, oh, fucking guaranteed. He's like, he's like, once you got out of school, come fucking hit us up. He's like, you can do it for as long as you want. Like, it's an easy thing to do as long as you're willing, you know, and, like, you're willing to learn and try. And, like, I was just like, dude, 
I want it so bad, you know? So like right out of high school, that was my goal. I was like, I'm going to intern at this magazine. And, uh, this is when trans world was still like trans. World, oh yeah. Trans it was, world, it, like. I mean, skateboard mag was around. So like they had lost some of their dudes, you know, but like trans world's huge and trans world had like insane photographers, Michael Mealy, Oliver Barton, CU, Trin, Skin Phillips, fucking yeah. Blair Alley, like all these dudes that were fucking doing it. And there's, there's more that I, that like, I don't know if they're staff, but they are regularly contributing, you know? And like, when I got to go there, I got to meet all these dudes. And I got to be a part of that. Cause I started interning like, probably like two months out of high school, you know? And I was actually there for three years. Um, my first year was like internship. And then after that, it was like a paid internship where I was like getting paid to do shit, you know? But like I had the opportunity when I first went there to like do some crazy stuff. And one of the first things I had to do was go through like 20 years of magazines looking for specific people in the magazine and like mark the pages with them on them so that they could run an article and skin Phillips was like the kind of the person that in the first year that I dealt with, he was the editor in chief and he like kind of, uh, was like my mentor somewhat, you know? And, um, I went through these tw 20 years of magazines, like slower than fuck, like looking at all these photos, just like getting super nerded out and like seeing my friends that I was like skating with at the time, like Windsor James was in there a bunch and like watching his progression through those magazines or just like seeing all the OGs. And I was just like, damn, this is crazy. Like, I remember this photo or like, you know, it's kind of like going down memory lane as I'm going through these 20 years of photos, but some of them were way before my time. But like, it was a really cool thing to like, that was like one of my first things I had to do. And it was really cool to help me learn and then like see what I should be doing or what I should be striving for, you know? And like, it was a great lesson learned, you know, like seeing mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, um, yeah, that was, that was like the first thing that I did for him. And then like, it started turning into other things where like skin would go out and shoot a photo. He actually shot this fakie tray flip of Dylan reader and Carl's on this gap that we called the corner gap. Whoa. And, um, he came in with all the, it was like, I think it was like five or six photos on like the slot. It was like the binder slide thing, you know, it's yeah, like a yeah, little, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what you call it. Like a transparent sheet that you put the negatives in. Mm -hmm. And he can't, he, I was in his office and he came up and he put them on the light table and he said, choose which one you like. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we need to run something I can't choose. So you choose. And I was like looking at all of them through the loop. And I was like, damn, I really like this one. It was like a slow shutter one. And they're like, all right, we're running that. Go give it to Desiree. And I was like, whoa, I was like, I'm making decisions like this right now. He's like, he's like, yeah, fucking do it. And I was like, that was like crazy to me at that point. I was like, damn, this is some fucking crazy shit. Like, and just learning how magazines worked and just like, I met so many people there. It was, a, uh, it was like going to college, you know, for the skateboard industry. Damn, that's crazy. There, I mean, that was like, that was just like some of the shit, you know, it was like, we we're going to lunch meetings every day and they're letting me get drunk. They're like, they're like <laughs> the homie Eric Stricker, RIP. He was the uh, editor at the time. And, uh, he was a mafia dude. No. Right. Is that Stricker? The, no. he would, like, they, the mafia I mean, he, yeah, he, he would always, he was fucking down for the he, mafia, but okay, he, okay, 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 he, yeah, yeah. he was from Chicago, oh, but okay, like he okay. was, he loved the fucking mafia. He was all about small and the fucking antics and the oh, party yeah. and like, he was a fucking amazing human. Um, he was the editor at the time and like they would get fucking cases of Red Bull all day long. Like so much swag, you know, comes through there, but like they'd get stacks of fucking Red Bull like flats where it was like 30 cans or some shit, you know? And he'd be like, take this over to fucking the, the corner store and fucking trade this in for an 18 pack, three steaks and some snacks. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, go fucking do this. And I'm like skating down the street with a fucking pallet of fucking red bull and he's like it will work i promise just go over there and i had lanny's id it was my fake id at the time and uh <laughs> i would just go through there and i'm coming out of there with all this shit and i'm like what the fuck am i doing and that was just like what it was like on a daily basis it was just like either we're going to lunch at hooters we're fucking getting some beer from the liquor store or like but it was like business as usual but it's like you know drinking as part of the fucking skateboarding as well you know 100%. and it was like it was so fun though like i had such a fucking great time there and like there was always so much shit happening, you know? It's like every day there was some different skateboarder coming in or, like, there was all this swag coming in and I could hook up all my homies. And, like, I basically was, like, a fucking rep flow. I was, like, rep flowing all my homies because I would just pull whatever I wanted out of the fucking, out of the gear, you know, because they didn't give a fuck. They had so much shit. It was, like, it was crazy. But, yeah, so I interned there for three years. After the first year of doing, like, random odds and ends and just kind of learning the thing, like, I started trying to push to, like, uh, do more. So like, I'd be like, Oh, I'll go cover this contest for you. Or like, I'll go do this. And like, I was sleeping in my car at fucking damn am. Cause I couldn't get a hotel and I didn't have any money. And it was like, 
They're like, oh, you slept in your car for three days to shoot this? Like, yeah, they're like, fuck, that's fucking crazy. We've never done that. I was like, well, I mean, you guys didn't give me a room, you know? Like, yeah, what the it's fuck? like, wait, they said as long as you're willing, right? Yeah, yeah. That's and what it was said. like, you know, it was fun, though, because I mean, I was sure I was blacked out by the time I fell asleep in my car, anyways, you know? So it's not like I was actually fucking too worried about it, you know? Like, <laughs> I had homies, I had rooms, but just like, oh, my car is there. I'll go sleep in it. Fuck it, you know? But yeah, so I started shooting a lot of shit and like submitting photos. I think my first photo of skating that I had ran in the magazine was a photo of a, it was a sequence of Anthony Schultz and he was doing a Nolly backside 360 off of the roof into bank in San Diego. Oh, the one in Skyline. Yeah, Skyline yeah, yeah, one. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And like that was the first sequence I had and like it really started going from there, you know? Like I got I just kept fucking getting psyched every time I had a photo. I was like, "Fuck, I can do this again. I can do this again," you know? And like it was just, you know, it was a big learning experience and it was like, I got really lucky. Um, I did a few interviews. Like I started interviewing, uh, Colin and Figgy a lot and like doing stuff with them. I did like, uh, I got to interview Schultz a few times. Like it was just like all the homies, you know, like I've been fucking living off the back of my homies sweat for fucking so long, you know, like they're your homies and you're doing this, but like to, I mean, the way you're talking about it is so like nonchalant, but it's like, dude, to people around the fucking world who are like skateboarders, the fact that you're like, I'm interviewing Figgy, I'm interviewing fucking Colin. I mean, granted, I see them all the time and it's like, they're just normal people. But like to the skateboard world, like, holy shit. That's like, yeah, I mean, they're like some of the most monumental skateboarders that are on boards in this day and age, you know, it's still. like, yeah. And it's like, they're going to be the, the fucking like the penny and the fucking Smolik and the fuck like those fools from the nineties, you know, are like yeah. even further on, you know, it's like they're, they're leaving their stamp on the fucking game for sure. The OGs. But it's like, yeah, that was like, I was constantly just trying to like find my way into posses of fools that are skating. Cause like if my homie stopped skating, it was the end of me. So then I had to fucking like, it was the end of my photo career. So I had to always keep finding new people to skate with. So it was like once the fools from NS were either like, done skating or partying too much or whatever. I was like, all right, I need to find a new group of homies. So then I seen Figgy was like in the birdhouse video. I forget what the name of it was, but he had a part in the birdhouse video and the uh, end. Yeah. Maybe it was the end. And like he was skating spots in Oceanside and I was like, who the fuck is this fool? I was like, how is he coming to Oceanside? And like, we're not skating with them. And I was like, fuck, I want to hit this fool up and see how like we can go skate. And then I had found out that Stoogs was like taking them to spots and I was like, Oh, I'm gonna hit up Stoogs, like try to go skate with these fools because that would be sick, you know. Like I wanted to shoot photos of people, you know. I think I had seen Figgy at uh what is it, the fucking San Diego contest they did at like uh at the the Mission Beach at the oh, roller like coaster. Am Slam. Am Slam. Yeah, I think yeah, I'd yeah, seen yeah. Figgy there one day when I was shooting it for Transworld and I was like, Hey dude, like I saw you're in Oceanside, who's taking you to spots or some shit? Like, just fucking with him. And I was like, let's go skate. Like, I'm trying to shoot some photos, you know? And he's like, let's do it. And then, like, fuck, that's kind of, like, how we started fucking, like, I started skating with those fools. And, like, I'd go up to Irvine fucking regularly. And, like, they'd be down here at Stuke's house. And we'd just be smoking tons of weed and fucking trying to go out and do whatever we can to get tricks, you know? And it was, like, shooting some fucking pretty crazy stuff. Like, I shot Figgy Front Salad La Jolla 18, which was fucking <sighs> super crazy. Like, Stop it. I think the... F I'm trying to think of what the first fucking photo I shot of him. I can't exactly remember. But, like, dude, I've shot so much crazy shit. I think I've shot, like, nine tricks of that fool on Maryland's fucking handrail. Like, or not even on the handrail, on the stair set, too. Because I shot his Baker ad where he tray flipped it, which was damn near probably 12... Just 13 14, years right? ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like in that photo, I mean, truthfully, I, I'm surprised Reynolds ran it. Cause it, I shot it like shit. I didn't know anything about flash durations or anything. So there's like motion blur to it. But at the same time, it's like this dude's flying down a fucking 14 stair, like 30 miles an hour. So to the fact to stop that shit back in the day with those shitty ass flashes was so fucking challenging, you know? And like, I still had no clue what I was doing. And I'm like shooting this dude that's fucking, tray flipping a 14 stair like at that time it was like no one's fucking jumping nobody's down shit like doing that, you know? that. Yeah, like, yeah yeah it was like he was putting his life on the line i uh am super psyched i had the opportunity to shoot shit like that you know like mm -hmm. all those dudes are like the reason why i if you could even say i made it because i don't know fucking what the hell that means but like the whole reason why i got photos ran in magazines and like made a name for myself was fucking because of those dudes and don't get me wrong like the NS crew was the reason why I started shooting photos, but those dudes are the ones that like really helped me gain a name. Cause I did like Figgy Colin joint interview in Transworld in like 2009 or something like that, you know, and they were both like 18 years old, you know, and it was like, 
I was out skating with these dudes and just trying to fucking make anything happen, you know, like, yeah. and I'm like, I'm fucking bringing wood to the spot to try to fucking get a photo. Cause I'm like, I want to shoot these dudes. Cause these are the fucking sickest dudes in skateboarding. And I was like trying my hardest to make it fucking happen, you know? And like, yeah. that was, that was really fucking sick. I, I'm really psyched that like that shit worked out the way it did. Cause now these dudes live in Oceanside, you know, it's like, it's crazy. It, it It's super crazy to like, again, you know, I grew up in Northern California and I grew up, I mean, Figgy is younger than me, but I also was like skating the council competitions. Mm -hmm. I remember watching Figgy eat shit at like a state championships at like uh, the Ontario Vans. Yeah. He fucking tried to kickflip back 50, like this gnarly fucking rail there and pre mode fell all the way down to the bottom, slammed his fucking face on the ground, gets up, does it. Yeah. That's like, what the fuck? You he's know, a I, fucking savage. He's a savage. But Colin, I don't know if Colin was skating there, but like Riley was there. They're all ca they're all like, castle kids. Dude, they all fucking killed it. And I then, never went to one castle contest. I didn't, know one. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what the fuck that was. I mean, I wasn't skating at that level anyways, but like I had no clue what it was. Like yeah. it wasn't anything that we were informed on, you know, like I grew up skating like uh, Mission Valley Y Park or like fucking San Clemente Skate Park or you know, like Oceanside Park, but like, or Encinitas YMCA, you know, like random yeah. parks, but like, we weren't tied in with all that shit. My dad was like some fucking newly sober dude that was like, all right, how do I get my kids to not be fucking crazy? Like, what can I do? All right, take them to the skate park. They could fucking waste energy there and fucking like, I can get them away from me for a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> and so that's how we like started getting into skating. It was like, a cheap alternative to like fucking team sports. Cause we were kind of over that, you know, like, but dude, that like, I'll, I'll I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump a little bit, but yeah, it's I'm like jumping. I, I'm, I'm constantly jumping. No, no, that's <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the interesting thing too, which is what I had talked about before the podcast is like fast forward to, you know, just last weekend, uh, or the weekend before that, I guess, um, you know, you shot Milton wins, Milton Martinez won uh skate. What is it? X games, real street. Mm hmm viewer's choice and uh regular whatever they did whatever that means and then you shot a couple of his photos for i think i only shot one but i was there the for crook, right? i was yeah i shot the crook which was in mexico city which i was lucky to get on that trip they were planning a trip and i was like oh i'm on let's go but yeah i was there for the kickflip which was the ender and that shit you didn't shoot that though no rhino was shooting so i shot some shit with a film camera just kind of like dorking around because it's like it's weird to like Multiple filmers are acceptable on a fucking skate, uh, on a skate sesh, but like usually multiple photographers is not acceptable. So Listen, like no, no. Rhino is super cool and he allows me to like fucking just walk around with the film camera. He knows I'm just dorking around. He thinks film's a joke anyway. So he's like, what are you doing with that fucking camera? And I'm like, oh, I'm just fucking shooting portraits, you know, but like I was there for it and it's like, dude, that shit was fucking scary. Like there was one instance where he was sliding on his chest trying to grab his board and I was like, dude, this fool's going to fly off this fucking 40 foot cliff. Like. Milton is, uh, he has no fear. He's not afraid, you know, like he's crazy, but yeah, I'm that's, very, well, that's what I was going to say is that like Lanny filmed it and like he got a gold medal cause he filmed his whole, his yeah, whole Lanny, part. The Rhodes family, Lanny brought the gold to the fucking, to Dude, the o. you guys are X games gold now. Nah, I'm not, not <laughs> us guys. Lanny is, we're just, we're, we have the same last name. Dude, he, that fool's. He deserves it. He's fucking worked his tail off for fucking years. Like, I mean, obviously, I know to him it means nothing, but at the same time, it's like it's a nice pat on the back, you know? Yeah. It's like who gets gold medals, you know? It's funny that the filmers get gold medals and this shit now, but it's tight, you know? It's like, hey, that shit didn't happen with just one person there, you know? Yeah, no, fuck no. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes into the fucking uh, the media side of things too. It's not it's not as fucking hectic, but it's like definitely takes fucking energy, you know? Well, I mean, it's like what we were talking about before the podcast. I mean, the, like, whether it's social media or you're actually act shooting there, there's so much that goes into it, and you're so focused on it. And then when you fuck up, oh yeah, it's just like, oh, I hate. So like for me, it's like I came up with photos getting ran in magazines, and now it's like there's one skate magazine in the U.S. that's like fucking really doing it, you know. So it's like now it's like pretty much everything lives on the internet, you know. It's like it's a challenge for me because I was like so psyched and like hyper focused on always getting photos in the magazines. And at one point I was getting fucking 15 photos a month ran, you know, and it was like tons of ads, tons of fucking, uh, tons of fucking like editorial. And it was just like, it's, it's so challenging now, you know, it's like, cause you're competing 
Thrasher probably has 200 people contributing to every, like, sending shit in. They're not getting it in every magazine, but there's people fucking, that many people sending in photos, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's a fucking hard market to fucking, to make it in. So it's like a lot of people shit, not even a hard market to make it in. It's just like, there's only so many fucking pages to be filled. So a lot of people shit just ends up on the internet, you know? And it's like, it's just the fucking way it goes, you know? Like that Milton Cricket grind, like I shopped it around for a while and it was like, hey, you know, it's like the clip's going in here. I was like, well, I guess it goes to Instagram, you know? Like, but... It's got to be seen. It's getting seen by people, you know. If Milton posts it, he's got fucking tons of followers. It'll be seen, you know. It's like, yeah, I don't know. You got to fucking go with the times, you know. Do you, you know, seeing us, I mean, like, well, actually, it's a two-part question. There's shop, There's magazines in, I mean, in Canada, there's, and, like, also obviously in other parts of the world. Do you, do they reach out to you? Do you reach out to them to run, to run photos? Uh, or? I've had stuff in like Canadian magazine, which they did reach out, but I think it went out of business. Like I, I shot a cover of Riley for this mag called color mag. And, uh, it was like a color. black and white cover for a mag called color, which is hilarious. And, um, but yeah, we shot the last, we got the last one, me and Riley. It was the last magazine before the, the magazine went out of business. Oh, whoa. It was a feeble on this double kink rail in, uh, I don't even know where the fuck it is like Irvine, I think. Um, but yeah, so that was the last one. And then I've had some stuff in Australian mags, like Slam and shit, but uh, it was always when it was an Australian, and it's not like they're not really necessarily hitting me up, like, hey, let me get a photo of Milton for our magazine, which I'm sure they'd like it, but I think it, like, works better if it's a photo of Milton in Australia, you know? But, like, also, they just, every magazine needs content, so it's like if they're hurting for content, I'm sure they hit up photographers and are like, hey, send us something, you know? Like, we need a Milton photo, we want a Milton photo, you know? Like, but, yeah, so, no, I don't really have... Uh, foreign magazines really hitting me up for like fucking photos, you know. I mean, everyone's everyone's got their photographers, and then yeah. it's like there's only so many pages to fill. Other than that, you know, and it's like I'm I'm on the CD team. <laughs> Do you like? But you were at one point you were on like the A team. Ah, uh, maybe a B. B. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> you know, but it's like it's what it is, dude. It's like there's fools with seniority, and then there's like fools with fucking good photos, and then there's dudes that are like can shoot photos but you know i don't know it's just like whatever yeah i mean you know what it's like i've had so much fucking fun with this shit and the fact that i've been shooting photos for 17 years and like i've got like what i've got out of it you know like this has been my job for the last 17 years minus some other random side jobs every once in a while chip i've been shooting photos with my friends traveling the world fucking having fun it's like how can i fucking be mad dude well that i mean that because like i feel like that's a really good segue like you go to eat you've been to ethiopia yeah six times six times yeah dude I've, I've been to africa eight times i went to morocco twice as well and i'm trying to travel more of it it's just like the thing is i need to be based in africa to really travel africa because it's a fucking long travel from here and it's like to fucking fly home from ethiopia and then fly back to fucking go to egypt it's like what the fuck is the point it's like i'm trying to move to ethiopia for like a year or two and just like make that my headquarters and just go to all these places, you know, like circle the circle, the fucking continent and do that, you know, cause it's like, there's so much shit there and it's so fucking cool. And it's just different, you know, well, like, what led you there? So we got on a job for uh penny skateboards. Our homie, Brad hooker was working. He moved out here from Australia working for penny. Cause that's where they're based or they came from. And, um, met him through the Australian homie, Australian homies, the homie Jack Kirk, who, uh, rides for HODL skateboards. And like, he was coming out here a bunch and cause he rode for inside, I believe is why I initially came out. But like, you know, we have Oceanside has been a very big hub for skateboarding. And we have so many fucking people that come in and out of here from other countries. And just like, we've, we've built a good scene around here, you know? And, um, yeah, so Brad came here and we were introduced to him through Kirksey and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm moving out here. I'm going to be working for Penny. And uh, this was, like, probably, like, two years after he came here. Like, he got me a job shooting Chris in the soy and, like, him skating a bowl. And and I think it's called the Bible Bowl. And it's in, like, Costa Mesa or somewhere up there. And then, like, just a bunch of random jobs. And he kept feeding us jobs because he was just like, oh, it's homies, whatever, you know. And then one day he's like, so uh, we had this conversation with this dude that we met that uh, started this nonprofit in Ethiopia. And we wanted to get them to make a board with Penny. And then we're going to go out there and document kids skating and all this shit. And he's like, you guys want to go? And it was like Lanny, myself, Bobby, BB, Shay, Paco. And then Brad was supposed to go. And right before the trip happened, he ended up quitting his job because there was like some crazy shit going on. And he's just like, dude, I can't stand this fucking business anymore. He's like, I got to get out of there. And it was like 
come on, just hold on until we go. Cause he's the fucking most hilarious person ever. And he's like, nah, I can't do it. I'm fucking over. I got a new job offer and I'm out of here. So we ended up having this other homie, Dave come that used to work for like vans and iPath, Ohio Dave. But like, yeah, so we, um, ended up going out there to document this board that they, um, had this collaboration they had done between BB penny skateboards and Ethiopia skate. And, uh, they had just finished building their first cement skate park out there. It was like 60 volunteers came to build a skate park, a concrete skate park. And, uh, we got there the day it was finished, which is weird. But, uh, yeah, we got to go there for that. And it was like document some kids pushing on penny boards through the country. And it was like, we're really going here to do this. Like anyone there could do this, but it was Brad just finagling a way to go have a f- good time with our homies, you know? And like, that really set it off for me because I was just mind blown. It's crazy. I came off of a 25 day volume four trip, flew out from Texas to Ethiopia with Bobby because we were on the volume four trip and it was like, we were already so burnt and we flew straight into, uh, we had a layover. We threw, we flew straight into Ethiopia or like we went from Texas to LA to Ireland, to Ethiopia. We met up with everybody in LA. It was like Lanny and BB and Lanny and BB and Shay and Paco were all sucking down fucking red wine because it was, like, free wine the whole flight or free drinks. And, like, BB's teeth were fucking red, and he's just, like, fucking cross-eyed, which is <laughs> – he's always cross-eyed, but he's a little more cross-eyed on the flight. And it was, like – I mean, it's a 24-hour fucking flight, dude. It's fucking insane. The entire like, day. Dude, it's fucking no joke. It's, like – it's really give, It's really t- taught me a lot of patience, like, traveling, you know, like, yeah. especially with flights like that. It's, like, Sammy Baca, when we were on that trip – on the volume four trip, getting ready to leave. I was like, fuck dude, I do not want to fly. I'm so over this. Like, this is going to be hell. And he's like, dude, what are you talking about? He's like, you got someone waiting on you hand and foot. You get to watch all the new movies, eat food, sleep, fucking post up. He's like, this is the sickest thing ever. He's like, I fucking love flying. When Sammy said that, I was like, damn dude, you're so smart. I was like, that's fucking tight. <laughs> dude. <I was> like, <laughs> Sammy Bach is a fucking legend. And if that's his outlook, that's my outlook, you know, like fuck it. But yeah, so like, Went there for that trip, and then um, we're only we're only on the ground for like five days. It's a whole day flight, and then we were there for like five days, four nights, I believe, and then we fucking flew back. Whoa. And it was fucking, it was hectic, you know, like it was like nonstop the whole time we were there, and it was like such a fucking, it was like an eyegasm, you know, how much shit's going on there, and I didn't really get to document it the way I wanted to, and like I see everything in photos, so I was just like, dude, I got to go back and shoot that shit. And the homie, Sean, Sean Stromso, who like was one of the co-founders of Ethiopia skate, he hit me up like a year later and he's like, Hey, we're uh, going to build another park out here. And he seemed really interested in it. Cause I kept in touch and he's like, if you want to come out here, I'll pay for your food and your lodging. If you fucking pay for your flight for this build, I was all, I'm fucking there, you know, like I'm not going to miss it. So I think it was a uh, 2017 that I went out there in October and we, uh, went out there and when I got out there, uh, Rick McCrank was accident like supposedly coming to town right when I got there because they were filming something for Vice. So I ended up being there for them filming this story, telling the story of Ethiopia Escape for uh, McCrank's show Post Radical. And um, yeah, I got to cruise around with that dude, which was like super crazy. Dude, and we're like super crazy. We're chopping it up in Ethiopia, like just talking about life. And he's like, "What the fuck are you doing here?" I'm like, "Dude." I don't know. I'm going to build a skate park. I guess I don't know fucking anything. I fucking, I'm not a mixed concrete. Maybe like it might be a little soupy or something, but like, it was just like, yeah, I'm here to fucking live life. I don't know. And it's just like super cool dude. And he's like, all the kids are blown away. They probably have no clue who he is, but like McCrank, McCrank, you know, saying his name is all psyched. Like fucking they're in love with this dude. Cause he fucking rips on a skateboard and that's all so they care good. about. They care about skateboarding, you know, like, so it was like super cool to be there for that. And then, um, we ended up going from Addis Ababa, which is the capital where we started. That's where you fly into. It's right also where the first coffee shop is. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's the spot. It's called Tomoka. I've fucking been there many times. It's fucking great. Damn. Um, but yeah, so we uh, go from there to the city that we built the park in is Hawassa. And it's uh, like a six-hour drive, five-hour drive. And it's like crazy dude it's like i'm walking down the street girls are running their fingers through my hair like blowing me kisses screaming i love you i mean i'm like what the fuck is this i'm like because i was there for a month and it was just like uh, uh i've never had this attention in my life you know like this is so fucking crazy and it was just like dude it was fucking grueling though we were doing 14 hour days every day fucking like i mean it's not even really that bad it's fun you know but like there was crazy parts like 
we had this fucking huge field and it would rain every day. We were there during the rainy season, basically we were like end of rainy season. And, uh, these fucking Tonka trucks, like huge fucking like hauling trucks are bringing all these materials like rock, gravel, fucking sand, all the shit to build the park. And every day the trucks get stuck in the exact same fucking mud hole. And it'll be one o'clock in the afternoon. We've been working for five hours. It'll be 10 o'clock at night. And we've been working for fucking 14 hours. And it's like, we got to get this damn three ton, five ton, whatever the fuck this huge ass Tonka truck out of the fucking mud. And it's like, I'm finding myself on my hands and knees or on my chest, like shoving rocks under the tires. And like, we're all pushing as a group, like trying to get the, it's like, so, so, so you can get some traction. And shit oh yeah, dude. It was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, you really learn how to do stuff in a fucking country that doesn't really have a lot. You know, it's like all the tools are constantly breaking. You fucking get a shovel, just the piece of metal and you have to find the fucking stick to fucking make it so that it's like able to be a shovel. You know, it's like, there's just so much shit that makes it like super challenging, but it also makes it really fun. You know? And it's like, I got really psyched on building, being a part of that and building the park and meeting all the kids is like the coolest thing. You know, it's like meeting all these kids that show up every day that are super fucking psyched to like, we're going to have a skate park or like, they don't even fucking really know what it is, but like, we're going to have this thing where we can ride this thing. And it's like, this is a place for us, you know? And it's like, they're showing up every day and they're trying to help, but they're really just getting in the way. But it's like, it's super fun. They're having a good time. We try to let them help build their spot, you know? And it's like, so park got almost finished before I left. I was uh, overstaying my visa if I fucking would have stayed any longer. So, oh, kicker to this story though. Mark Red Scott, the dude that like helped build fucking Burnside, who owns Dreamland, he came out for seven days, quick flash in the fucking pan to come help. And like, somehow I was his driver. I was driving him around in my homie's car and like taking him to get cigarettes or like, I was also helping him build this like vert wall that they built. And it was just like, I was with this dude every day and he was fucking madman, dude. Like, <laughs> It's like, where do you get chewing tobacco around here? And I'm like, I don't know. And one of the kids is like, you fucking can't find that here. Yeah, and he's Ethiopia, like, Ethiopia, bro. you get cigarettes. So this dude was fucking horking down cigarettes all day long. Just like, I swear he was chewing on them. I fucking don't even know. Like, this dude's fucking crazy. But like, he walked straight on the job site and he was like looking at some forums that were down. And he's like, nope, these are wrong. And just straight kicked them out of the fucking ground. And I was like, oh, this dude is not playing. Like, this is fucking crazy. But yeah, that was a really rad experience working with that dude and just like getting to kick it with him and just seeing how he operates because he's a fucking legend in like skateboarding and super talented skateboarder. But he like kind of started this whole like great skate park fucking revolution, you know, that builds these huge, really nice, good parks all around the fucking world, you know, like he was one of the dudes, you know, but like, um, yeah, so I was on that build. I had to go home and I fucking left right before the flat bottom got finished because it was like project was running out of money people were getting sick one of the dudes got malaria fucking it was just like tensions were high there was fucking like battles between countries like there's a bunch of french builders that hated the american builders the american builders were like beefing with the australian builders it was like getting kind of fucking crazy and i was like well i can stay but i was like you know i think they'll finish i gotta fucking go anyways i was like i'm out and then i came back like eight months later we got hit up to do some job for adidas and we were like it was like adidas main line was trying to sneak in some job for adidas skateboarding but didn't make anyone adidas skateboarding aware of it so then we uh ended up doing this job where we were shooting all these kids in product for them because they were trying to tell this story but this was like the preliminary shoot to see if it would work and they sent out all this shit and it got fucking jacked at customs like they fucking ended up picking through the boxes and like all that was left was like size 11 shoes extra large shirts and like all the shit that wasn't gonna fit kids that we were shooting it on and it was like we're shooting these kids after and it's like this kid's wearing a shirt down to his knees and I was like this is fucking out of control this is never gonna work but yeah so I got to go back to the skate park after we finished that job for Adidas and so it's like a six hour travel so we went over there and like I got to the skate park and all these kids just started running at me to give me a hug and I was like well this is fucking crazy because it's like eight they months they remembered you yeah they remember me it was like eight months later and I'm like these kids in Africa Ethiopia to be exact fucking care about me and are like running screaming my name to give me a hug and I was like well this is fucking crazy I was like what a trip like I I don't know if I affected them, but they cared enough to come running to give me a hug. And I was like, this is fucking crazy, you know? And I was like, that moment right there, I was like, I'm going to fucking donate a month of my time every year to just fucking go help somebody, you know? Like, and not even help somebody. Just go build something that, like, maybe changes somebody's life or, like, whatever the fuck. Skateboarding has fucking made so much difference in the life of, of me and my brothers and then, like, all my friends, you know? So it's like, why not take that somewhere where it's like, 
they don't have it, you know, bring it to new places and maybe it'll change someone else's life or like give them a new outlook or like teach them something, you know? So like I told yeah. myself, I was like, I'm going to do that. So then that was like the third trip that I was there. And then I've been back three more times. Like we've done random work, built another little small skate park. Like we got, uh, just got some money donated from uh, Cater and Baker Skateboards. They donated a, f- a big lump sum. So now we're going to use their money to build another park uh, coming soon, probably in the next few months here. We got, uh, we're got we trying to make some plans to build a bigger skate park, which will hopefully like bring more people out, you know? Should be interesting. But, yeah, this, this Ethiopia is fucking amazing. The food is great. The people are super kind. It's beautiful. There's so much going on, you know? Damn. I don't even know where to – like. I no, t- no, no, I no. could talk about that shit forever, you know? Like, I was going to say, let's pause real quick. Yeah. Go to the bathroom. Yeah. Dude, people fucking shred or just like yeah. going to the beach, staring at tits, whatever, you know, like, <laughs> um, but yeah. So like, he's just like super open to me traveling with him. Cause he's like, you're easy going and it's fun. And it's like, you have no schedule. Cause I don't really have a fucking schedule, you know, and like, which can drive me crazy at times, but like, it's very fortunate to have these opportunities for not having a schedule, you know? Yeah. But yeah. So, um, we're doing like probably a month around, Spain and then I think I'm gonna go I'm planning on tr- possibly going to Copenhagen I mean everything's so fucking up in the air I could end up in fucking Morocco I don't know you know but like um I'm gonna go to hopefully go to Copenhagen I know Lanny will be there with all the creature dudes and like there'll be tons of homies it's fucking one of the biggest skate events of the year for partying and just like shenanigans Copenhagen pro. yeah and I think it'll be cool to like document the scene and just like I mean, it's not like I will be the only person with a camera there but I love shooting photos and I'll see all my friends and it'll be fucking cool so I think it'd be cool s- to see depending on how everything goes with all this fucking COVID shit that's going on in the world. But, um, yeah. And then from there, I'm supposed to go to Poland and, uh, hang out with Tom, Tom Remillard. He has a house there and he said that I could stay, but I mean, this is all so fucking, I live every moment by the seat of my pants. I don't really try to make too many plans. So it's like everything could change in a fucking heartbeat. Like someone could hit me up and be like, Hey, there's a job. I'll be like, all right, I'm coming home. You know, like, I don't know. It's like, it just depends. But like, yeah, I do. I fucking enjoy traveling and it's like, I've lived in Oceanside and Southern California for 32 years, you know? So it's like, for me, it's like, this is all the same. I've fucking done all this, you know? And like, I just want to do different shit. I'm not sitting at the bars and I'm not fucking like really held down to anything. I don't have a chick or a kid or fucking animal. So it's like, why not fucking leave? You know, like why spend more time here? It's like, I save a lot of money by not going to bars. So I just fucking put it into traveling. That's my thing is like, before COVID happened, I was traveling like six or seven months out of the year and I was just fucking gone. You know, it's like either with, Riley's bands or homies bands. I'd travel a lot with bands. Like I did a whole tour across Australia with Riley's band and another homies band called Groom Rhythm. And then I did a tour with Radio Moscow across Europe and like fucking I wasn't driving on that one. I was just shooting photos, which is probably ideal, but I drive. I like to drive and I'm sober, so it's like everyone's like, I'll bring him, you know, like so Damn. it helps to have a sober driver, you know, and I'm fucking willing to take that fucking uh position. I like driving Trying to get you don't on the, smoke weed neither. I don't no. smoke weed, no. Damn. I'm trying to get on the Autobahn. If anyone's got a fucking nice car and wants to let me drive it on the Autobahn, let's go. Dude, <laughs> when I was at Transworld, I almost fucking got to shoot the gumball rally, and I was trying to fucking get on that. I was supposed to... So I used to do interviews for Transworld, and I, it was called Interviews with the Intern. It was basically just me talking shit to people. Like, I interviewed Shecky, and I was just, like, fucking calling him out or doing, like, random interviews, and people were talking shit to me, too. It was just fun, you know? It's like, I like talking shit. And, um... <laughs> I was supposed to interview David Hasselhoff and fucking, I was like 18, 19 years old. And I was like trying to get into this bar to interview him because it was like the end of the gumball 3000 and fucking, they fucking denied me at the door. And dude, if I, if I would have fucking interviewed David Hasselhoff, I had so many fucking jokes. I was like, (laughs) I was like, dude, I was so excited. Like it would have been the sickest fucking thing. Cause like, I don't know what it would have come of it, but it would have been just fucking cool to have, you know, like definitely would have been good, but you know, like, I just like to talk shit and I think it would have been fun to fuck with him. So I was on a job with this homie Dom. Uh, I, I assist this dude every once in a while. He's a fucking insane photographer. His name's Dom Cooley. And like, he's from Oceanside. I got introduced to him by our other homie, fat Carlos, who, uh, is a long time friend of mine. And so I've been working with this dude and it's like, I love photography and I love fucking seeing how people do it. You know, like it's, it's like back to fucking watching people shoot skate photos before I really knew what I was doing. This dude's an insane studio photographer. So like, I get to kind of shadow him around the fucking world. We've been to fucking all these different places and I'm like helping him set up while he shoots photos and I get to learn from him. But yeah, so we went to go shoot, uh, Dale Earnhardt jr. And Stop fucking it. we're, Whoa. we're at his, uh, it's called uh, Dale industries. It's where he fucking like, so he, I don't know if he's racing professionally anymore, but he like, 
he fucking hooks up all the racers' cars with his super secret fucking, like, I don't even know, like, engine components and fucking, like, racing components of the fucking shocks and the fucking tires, whatever he does to make, like, a fucking winning vehicle or whatever, you know? And uh, we went there to shoot, and, like, I basically... I'm not there to be like the best. They call it Digitech. Like I'm fucking sitting on the computer, kind of running the computer as the photos come through, you know. And like, I'm not fucking smart to be like the best or like know too much about it. I'm fucking doing the basics, but I'm not really there to be the technical guy. I think I'm really there to break the ice and just talk shit, you know. And like, I'm always doing it with like models. We're shooting all these crazy models or like musicians and shit like that. But we went to go shoot this guy, Junior. They call him. And uh, Dom had had a past relationship with him, like where like he shot him at his house, and like he's worked with them before, so they were cool. And I was like my first Probably time, like met like the dad and shit, like the senior. Ah, uh, I don't know about senior, but like uh, you know, they they had met. He had been to his house and shot him for like three days at his house, which sounds like fucking Travis Pastrana's house on crack. There's just like fucking a racetrack and all this shit going on. But like, oh, whoa. so like I was there and I was just like trying to chop it up because this dude was kind of like over it it seemed like you know i'm just trying to fuck with him like get him to smile so that the camera can get some of that you know and i'm like i'm like just at, i always like tell people to do karate kicks or like fucking try to crack a joke or something like that you know just to get him fucking moving and i was like <laughs> i was like what are your thoughts on talladega nights and he's like the movie and i was like yeah he's like i don't know it's like it doesn't really pertain to like anything that i do and i was like isn't it a movie about racing cars? Like, what do you mean? That's what you fucking do, you know? And <laughs> he's like, fucking Dale Earn- yeah. yeah. Junior. I was like, isn't it? Isn't the whole pre- preface of the movie is like driving cars around a track and like the dudes that do it? I was like, damn, doesn't pertain to you, huh? I was like, I was like, uh, that's crazy. He's like, well, yeah, but you know, I'm supposed to do an interview with Will Ferrell soon. Um, he's like, he's doing like a 10 year anniversary and he's coming on my podcast to uh, like play his role on my podcast from the movie and i was like damn that's fucking crazy i was like that's super, so sick that's like super sick but like yeah you know i was just like trying to crack jokes with them you know because like that's what i like to do i like to talk shit and i was like try i was like i don't know anything about fucking nascar other than the cars go in circles around the fucking track and burn a lot of gas like i'm like what can i say this to you i was like oh talladega nights i was like Dude. i gotta say something new about that you know and i was like can you say really thin pancake <laughs> I, was I love just, those things <laughs> i was just trying to like i was just trying to get a rise out of him you know like hey you know if anything he's just gonna kick me out of his fucking spot you know like the dude that i'm working with he fucking loves it he he brings me because he's like it's like it it makes his job fun because like these models are so serious and none of them are really having fun so he's like at least there's someone here talking shit i'm like throwing fucking empty water bottles at people and just like fucking with them I'm not trying to hurt them but like trying to get them to jump around you know like do something it's just always so fun you know like that shit's fucking super tight. I'm lucky to do that as well. But yeah, you know, like I do a few jobs where I'll work for like fucking seven days and I try to bail for the rest of the month or like at least stack it and fucking bail next month. You know, like just try to keep fucking moving because traveling is like taught me a lot. And it's like it's taught me a lot about uh, being patient. It's taught me a lot about the world. It's taught me a lot about myself because traveling by yourself is fucking challenging. I ended up in Morocco by myself on that Barcelona trip. The first trip to Barcelona. Um. I ended up, uh, I was like kind of over it. I was like three weeks deep in fucking in Barcelona. I was like, dude, it's just like the same thing happening every day. You know, it's like a lot of people walking around with shopping bags and like buying stuff. And it's like, they're probably tourists from Europe or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm kind of fucking over this. I want to see something like gritty, you know, cause I had been skating around every night, kind of avoiding people and just shooting like buildings at night with long exposures and shit like that. And, uh, I was like, fuck, where can I go? And I didn't really know what to do. And I started just like looking at a map and I was like, Damn, Morocco's really close. It's like a fucking 30-minute flight. And I was like, damn, dude. I was like, that place. I started looking at photos. I was like, this place is fucking eye gasm. You know, it's like, it's crazy. It's fucking so much shit to shoot. And I know these girls that had been there before, and I was kind of like hitting them up about it. And they're like, yeah, it's fucking amazing. It's cheap, and it's fucking cool. And I was like, fuck it, dude. I'm going to go. Isn't that like Gypsy Central over there? I don't know. I mean, it's crazy because like Morocco is kind of like the last stop before people kind of try to like make their journey to Europe from Africa, you know? So it's like kind of like mm-hmm. similar to the U S Mexico border where it's like, this is the last fucking stop before we got to get over that wall or that fence or whatever the fuck it is, you know? And it's like, there's this really crazy fact that like there's a piece of Spain on the African continent and it's only like eight square miles wide, but it's like Spain in Africa. And the thing is, is it's covered with fucking huge chain link fences, you know, like basically what we have equivalent to down South. And it's like, there's two of them in a row. And these people that are from all over Africa are like trying to get there. Cause once they touch that land, 
they are now on European soil and they can get transferred over to fucking actual continent of Europe and like be welcomed. So it's like once you touch the land, you're in, you know, you're on their continent. They're not going to fucking send you home. So like these people hide in the fucking bushes and like try to figure out the right moment to fucking get on these fences and get over that fence. Cause once they get over that fucking fence, I think it's, there's two of them. I don't know if it's the first one or the second one. I think it's the first one. Once you get over this fucking 20 foot barbed wire fence, you're on, you're in Europe and they take you to the fucking actual Europe, you know? So oh. like, it's fucking really crazy. So like, uh, Morocco has a very strong fucking presence of like people that are foreign to that area, you know? And it's like, it's like there's like very dark Africans and light skinned Africans and then like Arabs and it's just like it's really crazy fucking place, you know. So it's a mixed like, match. Yeah, it's a it's a it's like very a similar to here, pot, you know. It's, yeah. yeah, it's a melting pot, you know. It's like it's like you got everybody. It's fucking really cool and there's great food and it's fucking insane on the eyeballs, you know. Like for me, everything is I'm thinking with my eyeballs, you know what I mean? Everything is just visual and so like going there was a huge fucking mind fuck by myself because it was like in Tangier, where I landed, they speak Arabic, French, Spanish, and if you're fucking lucky, a little bit of English. And my Spanish is fucking terrible. You know, like I took two years in high school. I smoked weed every day and ditched school because my teacher sucked. And um, like being there, it was like, fuck, dude. I was like sitting at this fucking bus stop and they're screaming Arabic, looking at me, pointing in all these directions. I was like, fuck, are they talking about me? I was like, are they going to fucking do something to me? I was like, I don't know what the fuck they're saying. And they're like, just going crazy. And then some dude's like, hey, you want a taxi? I was like, yeah. He's like, where are you going? I was like, Chef Shao. And it's like, the, they call it the blue city. It's in the mountains. It's like, apparently it's supposed to blend in with the sky. It's fucking, everything's like that palette of blue. And they're like, all right. They're all, you can pay double and be in front. Or you can pay like the normal wage and be in back with five people in the back of a, a Mercedes Benz. And I was like, fuck that for two and a half hours. I'll pay double. It was like probably like 15, $20. I was like, yeah, whatever, you know? And so I went on this two hour ride with these dudes that mostly only spoke Arabic and they're just bumping music and we're cruising through the hills. I was like, damn, this is fucking sick, dude. It was so fucking tight, but it was like all those things of the unknown of traveling to somewhere by yourself. You don't speak the language. You don't fucking know anybody and you're just showing up and it's like, dude, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. You know? And like, I'm so scared getting out the plane and I'm like shaking and I'm like, dude, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. Why did I do this? You know? And then like, a day in, you're like, damn, this place is so amazing. What the fuck was I tripping on? You know, and it's like, yeah. that's like my new high. I don't fucking drink. I don't do drugs. It's like, I fucking get high off of fucking, it's not even new. Like I've been doing it for like, since I got sober, my first trip was like four months in, you know, like five months in. I was like, yeah. So Ethiopia, the first trip to Ethiopia was four months in. Cause I got sober in January and that was in like May, you know? Oh, wow. So it was like, or April or May. And it was like fucking that was a mind opener. And then I just kept going, you know, I kept traveling. I fucking did Barcelona and Morocco. I did fucking Panama. I stayed on a Island in Panama where I was, uh, there was no running water or electricity. I was there with my homie, Eric Bennett, who was putting on a photo workshop to shoot the stars. And it was like the dudes would pull up in their ponga that they carved out of a fucking palm tree. And they're like holding up a lobster and an octopus. And I'm like, which one do you guys want to eat? And they're like lobster. And he just dropped the octopus back in the fucking water. And it was just like, where the fuck are we? And we went through this super gnarly rainstorm. So there was no cover. We were sleeping in tents or hammocks, right? And our tent that we got, because I was sharing with this homie, because I was like the closest fool that knew him, didn't have a rain fly on it. So fucking this insane fucking thunderstorm comes. We're in the middle of the fucking ocean, like f probably like an hour and a half on by boat off the fucking coast. And uh, insane fucking rainstorm comes in. And... We're sitting there hugging our fucking camera bags in this fucking tent, and it's just a flood all the way around us. And I'm just like, dude, this is fucking out of control. And he's like, dude, I don't know what we're doing. And I'm like, <laughs> but, you know, like, if shit like that doesn't happen, you don't have a fucking story, you know? Exactly. So, like, exactly. we're, like, basically just watching the fucking pool rise, and it's just like we're in this tent, and it's like, you know, like, it's probably like a half a foot up to where the netting starts, so then the water starts bleeding out, you know? And we're like our bags are on our chest. I probably have like fucking five grand worth of camera gear on my chest and my bag. And it's just getting fucking soaked. And the dude that like lives on the Island. So in Panama, they're not allowed to sell the islands. So they can't like fucking sell it out to some Hilton or something like that. So it's all like native land. And, uh, we're on this dude's Island. He's like the furthest out into the fucking ocean. And, uh, he like ends up fucking pulling everybody out of their tents because it's fucking pouring so hard, and you can see the lightning and thunder. Fuck, like see the lightning, hear the thunder coming. And he's like, "You guys gotta get inside." So we all hung our hammocks inside of this dude's bamboo house. I think there's like eight of us. It's like made out of bamboo, palm fronds, fucking a little bit of sticks, you know. Like he's got a kitchen and a fucking bedroom, you know. And uh, we all start hanging our fucking 
hammocks to his house and every time someone gets in their hammock it's like the house caves in a little more caves in a little more it's just like are we gonna fucking bring this fool's house down right now with our fucking weight from just getting in these hammocks you know it's like dude it was the sickest fucking experience ever you know it's like but shit like that you know it's like i don't know i i've I haven't been everywhere. I fucking, I'm just trying to catch up to all my homies, you know, like these fools have traveled the fucking world. Like Lanny got to go to Russia when they're at war and shit. Like Lanny hated it, but I think it's like, it's a cool experience to be able to see that shit. You know, it's like, Story. I just want to, I just want to travel the world and fucking understand, you know, like I don't understand from like reading the book as much as you'll understand from being there, you know? So it's like 100%. traveling for me has taught me a lot. You know, it's like, I don't know what it's taught me, but it's taught me a fucking hell of a lot, you know? I think seeing different cultures, uh, to that point, I think seeing different cultures is the only way you can truly learn that and psychedelics. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of psychedelics. I, when I was drinking, um, when I was drinking, I wasn't really doing psychedelics correctly. I think it's like, it was thought that it's like, all right, let's take a hit of acid and drink a fucking 12 pack or 18 pack and just like fucking trip. You know, it's like, you don't really fucking trip that way because you're fucking covering it all up with the fucking alcohol, you know? And exactly. It's like, I mean, you can drink like a fucking fish, which is insane. You could fucking suck down a whole 18 pack really quick, you know? By but yourself. Like, but yeah, it doesn't, you don't even realize it. My favorite thing when I was drinking was like take a hit of acid and try to roll joints. Because it was like, dude, I could roll a joint in like 30 seconds. Me and Dixon used to have races like who can roll the fastest joint, you know? And like we just sit at home and fuck because we were rolling joints all day long. And uh, when Dude. you get on acid, it would take you fucking 30 minutes to roll a joint, which I used to roll in 30 seconds sober, like sober, not on fucking psychedelics. And you're just like, your fingers don't work right. And you're just like, nah. I don't know why doesn't it work. You know, yeah. you're just like tripping. But like, no. Um, So I was like kind of going through a dark spot through uh, COVID. And like someone recommended that I fucking uh, start microdosing. And like. I was very indifferent to it because I was like sober and big quotations, you know, and like I hadn't done anything in five years and it was just like, fuck, dude, I was depressed, you know, I was like, hadn't worked in fucking almost a year. I hadn't, I couldn't really do too much, you know, not, not everyone was skating because certain people were weirded out and I was like, I wasn't even shooting a ton of skateboarding that time. Like, so I was just like in this huge limbo and like I could surf and do whatever the fuck I could, but like, it wasn't really helping. Someone's like, you need to try microdosing. And I was like, all right, I started trying microdosing. And it's like, it doesn't get you high. You're eating like a 0. 0.02 gram, you know? And it's like, it was just like, it changed something in my head after like doing enough of it. It was like, I started just looking at shit differently. And I think that's what psychedelics is about. It's like changing your perspective, you know? And it's like, 100%. it really helped me. And then like, I got offered to go to Oaxaca for a day of the dead trip, like during the middle of COVID. Oh. So I went down there and like, I didn't know this was the plan, but these fools were planning on going to this town called San Jose del Pacifico. It's like a fucking elf town, dude. It's crazy. It's in the middle of the mountains, like two hours outside of Oaxaca. And it's like in the clouds, it's super fucking high up. And it's like dwarf town, all these like really small houses and just like super crazy. But Oaxacans are typically very short. So that's why it looks like a fucking dwarf town. It's like everything's really small. And my homies are like, yeah, we're doing a fucking mushroom extravaganza trip. And I was like, fuck, dude, I don't know if I can fucking do this. It's like against what I'm like trying to do you know and then like we got all the way up the hill and i was like i'm not gonna fucking do it i'm not gonna fucking do it i'm not gonna do it you know and we pulled up to this little hut and it was just like in the middle of the clouds and just like green and lush and fucking super rainforest and i was like fuck dude and like everyone's getting out of the car and i was like fuck 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 i was like fuck it i'm gonna do it i was like this is like <laughs> this is like not me fucking trying to get high. This is like a fucking spiritual fucking thing, you know? Well, there's it's a like, deeper meaning to it. You're, the, like well, you're being connected. I wasn't at a party, and I wasn't fucking, like, chasing after it. It fucking came to me, you know? And so it was like, whatever, I'm here. And, like, this little Oaxacan lady and this little Oaxacan dude are fucking, like, throwing this thing called a Temescal, and it's like a fucking sauna built out of adobe that you go in, and you throw rocks in the ground that are on, like, hot rocks, and you pour water on it, and it's got, like, a closure and it's like a fucking full on sauna. You do that for an hour and then they get out, they give you a little bit of fucking sugar water to drink and then they give you a mushroom tea. And like, I was super nervous about doing it. And like, I, I just didn't want to break my edge or whatever the fuck, like I'm not even straight, but like break the sobriety. And, um, I ended up fucking doing it and like, dude, I think it was like six or seven grams of mushrooms with the fucking liquid tea oh and then the mushrooms inside of them. Like they had fucking mud on them and like you could taste the grit of the rocks and the sand and shit. And it was like, holy fuck. And I was like, I was scared to eat all of it because it, it was the first time I was going to be tripping like that in so long, you know? And I was just like, I can't fucking do this. And I think I left like, it was probably like a fucking, 
I don't even know, like this much and mushrooms, probably like a fucking size of a bottle, like the bottom of a bottom of the bottle or the can or whatever, you know, Jesus. and it was like with the tea. So it'd been steeping for fucking a long time. Apparently they said like two weeks that that shit was just steeping. And, um, we were like, after the sauna, we're going to walk down into the jungle and it's day of the dead happening that day. Fucking fireworks going off everywhere. It's like, we're in this valley on the hill but like there's bigger mountains around us and people are shooting off fucking fireworks. They don't have any color. There's fucking big explosions. And I started tripping as I was walking down the hill and I felt like I was in like the civil war. I was like walking down the hill with my like clan of people. There's like eight of us doing it. And then the little lady that like had fucking bananas and fruit in her bag for us. And like, we're walking down the hill and like, I just hear, and I'm like looking around. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? Dude? I'm like, we're at war. Like, what the hell is going on? Like, I don't like. I just started tripping out of nowhere. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Like, they're shooting at us. Like, just tripping. And I'm like, dude, this is like <laughs> so next level. And then some girl starts crying. Like, there's just all this shit going on. Some kids throwing up as we're walking down the hill. Like, there's like three or four first timers on that trip, you know. And like, I mean, I was basically a first timer. It'd been fucking six or five years since I'd eaten any drugs, you know. And it was like at least at that level, you know, besides the microdosing, but it was like, holy shit. And so we got to this one spot. She's like, all right, we're going to stay here, you know? And she's like super quiet, super nice. And like, we're going to stay right here. And I was just like, all right. And I see this tree and I'm like, oh, that's my fucking tree. And I just go fucking like lean up against this tree, just like curled up. And I put my fucking jacket on my head and like, I could see a sliver of light out of it. And I was just like, all right, we're here, you know, like tripping. And, like, I closed my eyes, and I just started seeing that scene in the movie where the bomb goes off, and it goes from, like, black to white, black to white. It's just, like, in my head because I'm hearing these fireworks, and it's, like, doing something to my brain where I'm, like, seeing this, and it's, like, flashes of light and, like, dark, and I'm just, like, what the fuck is happening to me, you know? That happened for two hours, and then she fucking told us we got to go, and so we started walking up the hill, but it was a fucking insane trip. But, like, it did so much for me. Like, the stress of not... The stress that you can acquire from like not partying and just like not giving, having that thing to let go every once in a while, you know, it built a lot of uh, tension on my chest and like my head and my brain and my body, you know, and like that trip really cleansed me of all that. And it gave me a whole new appreciation for certain shit in my life and just like kind of how to live, you know, and it's like, yeah. it actually was so huge for me like to do that, you know, and I didn't think it was going to have the profound effect that it did, but it like really fucking changed a lot of shit for me. So yeah. like I saw it as a very good thing after that, you know, and like I talked to my dad about it, who's been sober for 25 years and he's like, Bill W who's the dude that started AA. He's like, Bill W was experimenting with psychedelics for the first like 10 years of his sobriety. And like, it's like, truthfully, it's like, what's worse. Is it like doing antidepressants or is it fucking taking uh, mushrooms once a year to like fucking try to clear your brain or like fucking flip that switch to get you back into a better spot, you know? And it's like, I got to do what I got to do to fucking keep myself fucking straight, you know? Cause it's like, dude, I fucking can go insane in the fucking snap of a fucking finger. Cause it's like shit just builds up on everybody. You know? And it's like, everyone yeah. has that thing. It's like, I smoke weed, I drink, I fucking do hookers, whatever, you know? It's like, it's like, you, everyone has this thing that they use to release and like when you're sober it's like you don't fucking have that so it's like everything just builds up on you and stacks on you and it's like if you're not like that's why i started getting into yoga where i was doing two fucking bikram yoga classes a day and running and surfing and like because if i don't fucking spend all my energy it's like it builds up and it turns into a problem mm -hmm. so like that was something that really fucking helped me like get a, a lot of shit off my chest you know and i think that there are tons of benefits to that shit you know it's like it's been demonized but it's like people gotta look at it in a different way you know yeah, no, I completely agree. I don't, yeah, I drink here and there, but I definitely have uh, stopped smoking weed. I haven't smoked in a while. And um, mushrooms has definitely become like the outlet, but it's like, I'm not, I'm not doing it every day. It's just like, it's like when I need to chill. There's a big difference between eating fucking an eighth of mushrooms and eating like a half of a gram of mushrooms, you know? Cause yeah. it's like, you're not you're not tripping on it and it's not fucking gonna kill you but it's like there are some fucking crazy effects that it can do for you you know and like well, it clears your brain like like what you're saying like relieving that shit off your chest like when I, i'll usually eat like 1.2 to 1.4 yeah i mean that's and that's like a that's like something that will definitely change the way you see things you know but it's like yeah. you're i don't think you're still necessarily tripping but like i i had eaten like some point fours 
And it was like, holy shit, like my fucking chest started beating. I was like, damn, I think I fucking ate too much, you know? And I'm like, this is fucking crazy. But I wasn't like visually tripping, but it's like, it can start giving you that anxiety of like, what the fuck's happening around me type shit, you know? Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, I think there's a lot of benefits to it. And I think eating mushrooms is better than smoking cigarettes, smoking weed, drinking. Like, it's better than all that shit for sure. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's natural. It's from the earth. And it's like, I think that we've demonized a lot of things from the earth, you know? And it's like, uh, don't knock it till you try it. But the thing is, you're not going to be able to try to get fucking all the fucking people that are making laws to fucking do it. You know, Dude, it's like the, it. the brotherhood of eternal sunshine or eternal love. Have you heard of them? Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. Brotherhood. They were trying to dose the whole world. They're like part of, they're like homies with Timothy Leary and they were fucking like, I have this homie that I met. His name is fuck. I knew him through this dude I was getting fucking weed from and like he was one of the main dudes and he was telling me stories where he was like smuggling drugs from Iraq in the 60s and Afghanistan where like he would go and get like vintage fucking musical equipment and like fill it full of drugs and then transfer it to Europe and then transfer it to the States and it was like, huh? You know, (laughs) and I'm just like. I could sit and listen to this dude. His name's Travis. I could sit and listen to him for fucking hours because he's like this 75-year-old dude. He's like, I've been to jail a few times. He's like, one time I got caught with like 19 million, two boats, eight cars, four properties, all this shit. And I'm just like, this fool is like one of the original pioneers of smuggling fucking drugs, you know? And it's like, but their whole their whole thing was like, we want to fucking dose everybody because it's like, if people that are scared would do it, they would see there's nothing to be scared of, you know? It's like DMT. It's like, I've never done DMT, but everyone says like when you do DMT, you're you better be prepared for your demons because they're coming for you. Thing is, you have to fucking fight your demons. It's like a fucking video game. It's like you fight your demons to clear yourself of your fucking internal problems. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. that's kind of the same thing with mushrooms and acid. It's like you have to fucking know that you're gonna fucking f- have to fight some shit in there. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's like a game. I don't. I definitely have had, I definitely have demons, but every time I've ever done psychedelics and the reason I'm such a big advocate for psychedelics is because of the fact that every time I've done them, whether it was acid, whether it was mushrooms, haven't done DMT, um, neither I, I've come out a better person from it. Yeah. I mean, in my I, opinion, I, I, um, I've had bad trips, but then when you look at them after you're like, Oh, that wasn't actually as bad as I was playing it out to be, but it's like, maybe you're just overwhelmed. But I mean, I think you have to be, you have to walk cautiously with that shit. Cause you know, some people have, um, some people have fucking problems with in their head. You know, some people aren't as fucking exactly. stable or so, aren't as uh, secure with themselves. And it's like, if you don't have a strong mind, sometimes that shit can fuck you up. So it's like, yeah. you got to fucking do that shit in doses that are small and work your way up. Unless you want to fucking be a supercharger and go big, but it's like, it could have some effects, you know? <laughs> and like, I mean, <laughs> we've lost some effects. We've lost some, not like lost some friends physically, but like, mentally like that have just like gone off the edge because they've done too many drugs and it's like you see all the people that are homeless on the streets and like everyone has a different story but i guarantee you a lot of those people have fucking problems with drugs and fucking problems with their fucking brain as well and like when you mix those two things it can really fuck some shit up you know it's like that can happen up just off of weed oh yeah i mean dude one of the homies in ethiopia thought he was a fire breathing dragon from smoking weed and fucking doing this shit they call chat it's like coca leaves and it's like an amphetamine and like dude he asked me if he if i could feel the fire that he was breathing on me and i was like fuck dude like it's insane how fast you can lose yourself my dad when we were growing up always said like see a fucking we'll see like a i don't want to call him a homeless but like someone that's just down and out on the street you know and he'd be like He's like, you are one brain cell wall with away from being that dude at every fucking moment of your life. He's like, very cautiously, if you're going to do drugs and fucking party, know that that is something that you can turn into. Like, don't allow yourself to fucking do the wrong shit and end up right there in that position because it's like, it's hard to come back from that, you know? And it's like, it happens every day in society, you know? People fucking fall off to the streets and drugs and it's like, Where'd your homie go? Where'd your son go? Where'd your fucking dad go? It's like, oh, he's on drugs, living in a tent down at fucking San Luis Rey on the riverbed or like living on the streets in L.A. or some shit. It's like that shit can fucking hit anyone super hard, you know? No, I completely agree. And that's also another reason why it's like, you know, I don't ever try to be like, you know, rude to anybody, especially people who are less fortunate than we are. I am. It's just because like, dude, that shit can change in a fucking heartbeat. The way it can change it that quick the way my grandfather raised me was you treat the dude that cleans the toilet like you treat the dude that owns the toilet exactly you, know? you you don't you don't judge anyone until they give you a reason to fucking have that thought to judge them mm-hmm. you know because everyone's fucking going through shit and like 
we've been very lucky to grow up with a lot of good examples. My dad moved homeless people that were on the street into our house all the time, like let them live in the garage or the backyard or like we've had fucking meth heads and fucking drunk people. I grew up in fucking AA, like going to the fucking meetings before I was fucking, you know, I, my dad got sober when I was like seven years old and like I've seen every fucking walk of life. And before that, my dad was a fucking party animal, drug addict, fucking everything, you know, like the whole reason we ended up right here was because my dad was dating a hooker and she fucking was our babysitter and uh, she got in trouble and my little brother was in the car. So they took uh, him to child protective services. And my dad had to get sober and that changed our whole entire life, you know, and it's like a fucking really crazy story that like probably could be told another day, but it's like, it's fucking like big John's whole life changed and that changed our life, you know? For the better. Oh, yeah. Fuck, 100%. Because I'd be a fucking meth head or, like, all the kids we grew up with are dead or in, in jail or on drugs, you know? Like, for the most part. Like, from that era when my dad was still partying. Fuck. But, you know, like, we got a good life. We're living it up and we're fucking happy to be here, you know? And we'll leave it right there. That's uh, 120. Respect, motherfucker. Dude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, JT. Yeah, hope that hope that did something for you guys. Dude, <laughs> I... <laughs> That's the quickest an hour 20 has ever gone by. I mean, like, I'm sorry. I have to cut it a little bit short, but like, dude, well, just we will. opens it up for another one. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, this is like when you get back from your trip, we'll sit down again. Yeah. We'll bring in somebody else. You know, let's get fucking Milton in here, dude. Let's fucking get Milton in here. Let's get fucking Shay in here. Cause dude, when Shay gets in here, he gets a little saucy. He's just like, Oh dude, he gets, you know, I, I like to have drunk people around me. Cause I think it just <laughs> brings, it brings fun to the table, you know? And it's like, if he comes here, I'll fucking shotgun some beers for him and make him drink them so we can get him really turned up. <laughs> well, Wade Boggs his ass. Bet. All yeah, right. Fuck yeah, let's do it. All right. Thank Respect. you so much, JT. Thank you. All right. Peace. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, JT. That was an amazing episode. And dude, that dude is, has some of the sickest stories that I've ever heard. And I can't wait till he gets back from Spain with the stories that he's going to have then. Again, thank you so much, JT. I really appreciate you coming through the show, brother. And guys, like normal, I want to say thank you to everyone around the world who continues to support Caffeine and Green by listening, getting coffee, whatever. I see you guys, and I appreciate every single one of you guys. So please also, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. We're streaming on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts. You name it, we're on it. That's right. Head on over to caffeineandgreenroasting.com as well to get all your coffee needs. And guys, lastly, please take care of each other. I know things are getting still crazy out there, but show mad love. Take care of each other. Wear your mask. Don't wear your mask. Whatever. Just be cool, and I will see y'all next week. Peace.